I just want to uh, begin uh, by telling you, as I said last week, what a, a great privilege it is to have all of you uh, taking the lecture series. We have so many people lined up throughout the course of this uh, particular uh, semester that you're going to absolutely love and you're going to get some tremendous experience. Last week we had Bill Child and I just want you to think about uh, being 82 years old and uh, having accomplished what he has and still be as fit as he is and articulate. Uh, just a really an amazing experience to uh, hear from one of the great entrepreneurs. But we have many uh, entrepreneurs that uh, are going to be speaking this semester. So um, in terms of my own experience, I, I thought the, the purpose of me speaking at all in this, in this class is to be able to articulate what you should get out of this class and why this class will be meaningful to you. So um, one of the things that I think is important uh, that you may think that you've figured out, but maybe a lot of you still haven't uh, decided is who you are, and that is, what is it that you'd like to be? I know a lot of seniors who still haven't uh, determined what exactly that they want to do. So it's no surprise that uh, most of you or a lot of you might be in that situation. But I'm hoping that by the time you're done with this class that you're a little more clear about what that should be. I also want you to understand the value of networking. It took me a long time to learn the value of networking, but I can tell you that uh, for several of my businesses, that networking was the difference between success and failure. So I want to share with you the importance uh, of networking during the course of this class. Also, if you decide that you want to start a business, I think that you will all agree that if you know how to start a business, that that will improve your chances. In past years, um, the number that everybody's thrown out is that nine out of 10 businesses would fail. Have you heard that number? Does it make you excited about starting a business? Well, I'm here to tell you that uh, times have changed and we're gonna show you how to make it so that it'll actually be an exception if you fail in a business. It won't be, uh, because you'll quit before you ever get started by following the right process. Um, if you decide that you're not going to start your own business, but that you want to work for somebody else and do a great job for them, then what we have to talk about in entrepreneurship is still life-changing. Innovation has been something that has plagued uh, corporate America for decades and decades. And, and in today's environment, you're going to learn the importance um, that when you leave school, that you're going to have to continue to innovate, you're going to have to continue to differentiate, you're going to continue to have to learn in order to survive the world that awaits you uh, because it's changing so fast. So this is, this again, you know, the important, uh, importance of learning uh, entrepreneurship. If you decided that you wanted to go into the public sector, well, I think everybody knows that the public sector is completely broken. And it needs a lot of fixing, and it takes innovation and differentiation to figure out ways to solve the problems that we're facing here in our country. And then if you decided that you wanted to be a physical therapist or a doctor, a lawyer, or you wanted to teach piano lessons or dance lessons, or I don't care what type of small business that you decided that you wanted to start, um, then you need to understand differentiation. You cannot just go out and do what everybody else is doing and figure that you'll make uh, a lot of money. You'll do much better if you learn those principles. So basically the bottom line is that entrepreneurship is for every single one of you and you'll be able to see its fruits in your lives in various ways depending on what you choose. Also we want you to be able to have uh, the opportunity of seeking out many lessons learned from these entrepreneurs that are going to be speaking. Now, this won't be, this won't happen from you coming and listening to them any more than a simple reading of the scriptures is going to give you a great deal of gospel knowledge. I'm going to let that settle in for a minute. I want you to think about what that means. You're going to have to really learn how to cull through or mine these tidbits of information and read between the lines sometimes as to what really helped somebody succeed so that you can apply that to your own self. 
So you're going to have to listen carefully, and it doesn't really matter whether, the most, whether they are the most engaging speaker in the world. Most of them will be. Occasionally, they won't be the most engaging speaker you've ever heard, but they all will have a great story. And the fact of the matter is, it's, it's not their ability to public speak that made their success. It was their ability to understand, to know, and to follow correct principles, and you can take that from each one of those things that, uh, that you're gonna be learning. So, and so with every class or anything you do in life, the more you put into this class, the more that you're gonna get out of it. And I'm betting that most of you, by the time you're done, will say this is one of the favorite classes that you ever had in, the Mer or in uh, your experience here at Brigham Young University. I want you to know that this is the most important entrepreneurial endeavor that uh, I ever undertook. Nothing means more to me than my uh, wife and, of 34 years and my five children and our 10 grandchildren. There's only seven there, that's because this is about three and a half years old, but this is the most important thing that you'll ever do. When you hear all of those comments here at Brigham Young University about getting married, I know you get tired of it and so on and so forth, those of you who haven't uh, uh, jumped over, we always tell people not to take two hours to watch 60 minutes. I'm waiting for you to get that, but actually you probably don't watch 60 minutes, right? Well, neither do I, but I did a few years ago. But it's important uh, to recognize that uh, there are some things that are worth more than, than anything else. And we're here in mortality for one thing, and that is to marry, to have families, and to fulfill the measure of our creation and all the things that we talk about uh, uh, about making a living and making money are just extraneous to the real reason why we're here. I hope that uh, everyone recognizes that. I certainly do, and, and that's why I put this out as the most important entrepreneurial endeavor that I ever did. And I have to tell you, the reason it's entrepreneurial is because the difference between entrepreneurship and business is, and I'll give you the definition, is that Entrepreneurship is discovering the answers to unknown, untested, untried, unproven business models. And business is executing on a known business model. Well, I can tell you that when you get married, you have no idea what you're getting into just uh, at the time. Only down the road will it all reveal itself. So it's an entrepreneurial endeavor that you've got to learn a little bit about. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got started in business because everybody has a different path that they're going to take. Uh, some of you here in this room will start a business while you're in college. I don't think I was ready to start a business while I was in college. So everybody has a different path. So when I think about my early career of going into sales and sales management, becoming a national sales manager and finally a general manager, and then, um, and this was the first company that I worked for, by the way, it was a division of a Fortune uh, 1000 company called NCH Corporation out of Irving, Texas. And in six months, I became the top sales representative out of 225 representatives that were in the organization. And um, I still felt like I had no idea what I was doing, but I did know that I had the ability to outwork most anybody that I knew. I knew that I had the ability to be able to develop relationships of trust and I knew that I would, uh, any commitment that I made, I would keep. And it's interesting how far the trust will go when you make and keep commitments, when you're honest, and when you develop relationships. In fact, I count uh, some of those individuals today from back 30, 33 years ago um, as, as still good friends today. Um, because that's what life is all about, is relationships anyway. So I had the opportunity of moving into sales management. Now you'd think that'd be all exciting and everything, but I'm, I guarantee you that there is a lot to learn because just because you're a good salesperson doesn't mean that you're a gifted manager. And it took me two years to really learn how to understand the art and the science of becoming a great sales manager. And then to become a general manager and learn the rest of the blood and guts of the business so that you could actually succeed at all S uh, at all aspects of running the business. So the business that I uh, ended up becoming the general manager and vice president of was uh, Orthopedic Casting Laboratory that was later sold to Stryker. And uh, OCL developed this uh, patented product to splint 
individuals, instead of building a cast or a splint from scratch, it was now all they had to do was cut off a length and put it in water, wrap it uh, around your arm, it would harden, and then you had your bona fide splint. So it saved a lot of uh, time and energy on behalf of the doctor and his staff. Um, so then I decided uh, when I um, had had enough of working for other people, I had started a number of territories. I knew I had the skill to be able to sell. I knew I had the skill to be able to be a good sales manager. I knew that I already understood um, supply chain, that I understood a bit about finan uh, finance. And so I'd had uh, practice putting out forecasts and budgets and all the different things that you've got to do when you're in business for somebody else. And it's the same when it's your own business. So I had a lot of confidence and I felt comfortable mortgaging my house. I had uh, my wife and three kids mortgage. I'd had uh, two vehicles that I had uh, owed some money on. Uh, the money that I had was all tied up in my house and so that's where I accessed it. So some of you will think that that's a little bit risky, but entrepreneurs aren't really big risk takers. What they are is comfortable in their own skin. They're able to make decisions. They make those decisions, they live with the consequences, they're informed decisions, and you'll find that uh, uh, the confidence that they have to make those decisions comes from the underlying experiences that they've had prior. So it's not just uh, being, um, you know, the wild, wild west and just deciding to be a gunslinger and, and uh, go do something wild. No, it's very careful and thought through. So that was the uh, first business. We bootstrapped it through internal uh, profits, we developed successful protected distribution model, and we developed a proprietary sales and management system. We became one of the nationwide leaders. We had 150 distributors across the country, and we harvested the company to Cintas in 1970, 1997, myself and my partner. And um, it was uh, what I like to call as simple and non-sexy, non-technical products, but they were products that people had to have there was a great market for them, and we had to differentiate ourselves in the way that we had our sales system, in the way that we trained and taught our distributors. And um, the, when we made them successful, they made us successful. So that was the first business. Um, when I uh, sold the company, um, I decided to go a different direction. Since I didn't have to necessarily work for a living, I decided to follow my first passion as a philosopher. So I wrote a book called Where Have All the Profits Gone? Now, lest you think that uh, this was an easy endeavor, my, um, this is a very technical book. There's, it goes way deep. It uh, starts with Adam and goes through the uh, uh, 19th century, and it only uses the Pseudepigrapha, the Apocrypha, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi Library, and all the early Christian writings to demonstrate the rise of prophecy and the decline of apostasy through each dispensation of the world. And so no one could really tell that I was Mormon or not Mormon um, because that wasn't the intent of the book. It became a history book, if you will, as well as a theological book that would awaken people to the, uh, some of the things that happened all the way through the process. So I uh, was asked many times why I decided to be an author, and the answer is I never intended to be one. It wasn't on my bucket list. But I did listen to the voice of the Spirit, and for whatever reason, it seemed to be what I was supposed to do. So I called it learning by faith because I didn't have a PhD. I didn't have uh, any type of training in the field. And so it took me a long time and I call it the most expensive book ever written. Um, but uh, I do have about uh, 6,000 people who bought the book. Those are 6,000 copies printed. And uh, I have sort of a small cult following of people who thought it was a very cool book, but it was a very difficult book to read. In fact, my wife, um, when I read part of the manuscript to her many years ago, she said, well, Scott, I can tell that this is a book that I won't be reading. <laughs> and after almost 10 years, she hasn't disappointed me. <laughs> but a lot of people have read it, and they've loved it. Um, so it was an entrepreneurial uh, endeavor because it wasn't planned out, and it wasn't something that I knew a lot about. It was something that I had to learn on my own, and I had to find out about. I had to find the answers to unknown and untested questions, and I explored things in a way that no other author had ever done in that particular uh, genre. So I just have finished a new book called Do the Mormons Have a Leg to Stand On? A Critical Look at LDS Doctrines in the Light of the Bible, 
and the teachings of the early Christian church. So this book really, uh, again, isn't to promote Mormonism, but to show that uh, Mormonism is indeed uh, orthodox, that it matches the teachings of the first century church, not the fourth century church, which by that time had corrupted the early teachings, but of the first century church. And uh, of course, it has a ton of source material behind it. But in the middle of all that project, I decided it was time to up and start another business. And so I started a technology company called APU Solutions. And APU Solutions brings together the supply chain of the property casualty insurance companies, you know, the state farms and the all states and the progressives and uh, even Warren Buffett's uh, 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 insurance company. And in that particular business, uh, we brought together the supply chain of the insurance companies, the collision repair shops, the salvage recyclers, and in doing so, we're able to help them to source and secure alternative parts or salvage parts, recycled parts, to repair their vehicles uh, for the insurance industry. I could go on for hours about how this changed and transformed an entire industry, and it did. And that's why we call it entrepreneurship, true innovation disrupted the entire industry and completely displaced uh, the players that we're currently in and how those uh, products were sourced and uh, uh, continues to be a significant benefit. So one of the things though that I want to point out today is that I made a lot of mistakes in this particular company. I didn't understand the lean process uh, at the time. It was a company that we started at the end of the internet bubble, uh, myself and a couple of other guys. And um, I put in half a million dollars of my own money to begin the funding of it. And we raised about $8 million. And the, close, the closing of that uh, financing happened on April 13, 2000. That was the day, the precise day, that the internet bubble broke. The day that the tech market, the NASDAQ, went down 318 points and then went on a precipitous drop from there. So the eight million that had been promised to us turned into one million dollars, and unfortunately, we had already spent and committed the first million dollars to technology that we hadn't tried and proven with customers. Therefore, it ended up being a waste of money and a waste of about a year. So we started over, we scrapped it, and we just started again. So start lean. I also learned that boards can be really helpful. So for the first time, I had a board, and these guys were phenomenal. I had John Leach, who was the former chairman and CEO of Western Auto when it was doing $2 billion in 1989. That's a lot of revenue in 1989. Now it would be a small company. It wouldn't be a, a Fortune probably 1,000 company today. But back then, it was a, a Fortune 500 company. It was a very uh, successful. And John Leach was the chairman and uh, uh, CEO of Western Auto. Another guy, Larry Maddox, was considered the, vent, uh, the father of venture capital in Kansas City. Another guy, Tom Gigax, had sold his uh, tire store chain um, for almost a billion. And so I had some incredible people that were on my board and that were helping me to guide through the, uh, the landmines. And because I had a good board and smart people, um, we, the four of us self-funded it and we uh, actually were able to uh, harvest the company. We made a lot of incremental learning, had some timely pivots after that. Um, I learned that leadership is everything. I can tell you a moment when I was sitting in Paris, France, celebrating my 20th wedding anniversary, and I got a phone call from one of my partners saying that two of our other partners had just walked into our bank account down in Spring, uh, Springfield, Missouri, and uh, emptied our bank account and walked. Now, I could go and sue them. How many companies in litigation have you ever heard of that got any funding? Well, I can t tell you the answer is probably zero, uh, certainly of small startups. And so that wasn't going to be an avenue that we were going to be able to take. And if you've never been in litigation before, then you'll understand that it's just something you never want to do. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of focus. And, um, and so I stood up in front of all of our uh, company um, when I got back, and not one of those people left the company. They all stayed. And nine of those people out of 11 
were there at the exit and all profited. And that was 12 years later. That's a long time. So we did a few things right there. So another thing that I learned is that it, success happens to people who never quit, okay? It isn't because we're geniuses. It isn't because we have more intellect or more capacity or more capability than you do. It's that we just didn't stop and we didn't get scared. And we put one foot in front of the other foot until we finally prospered and succeeded. And we overcame every hurdle and every obstacle simply by understanding the obstacle, breaking it apart, developing a solution, developing a solution and working right through the middle of that solution. And that's how problems are solved and companies are built. And then we had a successful harvest selling to Autotex, a Solera company, which was, a, again, a Fortune 1000 company uh, with a, a large worldwide imprint. After that, um, you heard uh, Steve Little talk about this company. I was right in the middle of my tech venture, and we had recognized a very important thing too late. And that is that the insurance industry would never buy our product in mass until after the entire industry went wireless. This is in 2000. So do you know when the industry finally was completely wireless? 2006. So we were six years to profitability. So I said uh, to the team, I said, you know, I don't have any problem working for free but I probably don't like the idea of working a number of years and not knowing what that is. Um, I don't like the idea of working a number of years for free and also then having to fund the company at the same time. So I said, I'm gonna step down as the CEO of the, of the venture. I'm gonna elevate um, an individual that uh, was our senior vice president of sales and marketing to the COO spot, president and COO, who eventually we elevated to be the CEO and I'm gonna go out and do another venture. And I got a phone call from a friend in Kansas who had moved back to Utah. And so we decided to build this company that was doing about a million dollars a year. And so we took it from one million to 35 million in six years. We sold it to a private equity group in 2007. And the lessons that I learned in this is that, you know what, we became the best vinyl fence company because we had amazing people people that were just gifted. And you will never build the back of the company, a company on your own back. It will be on the backs of A players. Gifted, quality, A players. And that's uh, one of the things that uh, played itself out over and over again in our company at Best Vinyl. Um, it was efficient and well run in each of the individual departments. I likened it to playing basketball. So in basketball, you know, there's a lot of different functions that you can break apart. So you've got to have a good shot, right? Technique and everything. You've got to have a good free throw. You've got to be able to pass. You've got to be able to rebound. You've got to be able to play defense. And you've got to be in good physical condition and so forth. So the point is that you can break each one of those apart. And I remember my, young, my oldest son, uh, when he was about uh, five years old, I hired a college basketball player to teach him how to dribble. So you get my point there. Well, what's the, what's the analogy then? Well, um, we took every different branch of our business from administration to operations to fabrication to installation to um, uh, finance and so forth, and, uh, and, and we had a sales juggernaut and a marketing and branding machine. In fact, I think more people recognized our vehicles then they probably recognized UPS back in the day. So it was, a, it was just a complete branding exercise. But I also learned that private equity groups are great finance people, but they're not, they're not always gifted uh, operators. And so my partners and I, we talked uh, ad nauseum during the time of the uh, um, downturn in the economy. And I was, I was with a, a Fortune 500 CEO and we were talking about the economy, and he said, we were having lunch one day, and he said, Scott, you know that nobody on the planet 
has gone through anything like we're going through. No one knows exactly what to do because all the ones that did back in the Great Depression, they're dead. (laughs) And that's how difficult that environment was when you were building a company, especially like ours, through the middle of that recession. And so I recommended numerous steps to the private equity group, which they determined that they just wanted to continue to go on and grow. And so that came a good uh, point in time for me to exit the company. Um, But my partners later on, after the company did falter, uh, had the ability uh, to be able to buy it back from the mezzanine lender. And so now it's back in good hands and they're doing fantastic work again. So um, one of the things that we did is we refined our systems and processes. When I very first came in, the first thing that I did was I actually reverse engineered the entire company. And I started with every department in the company and I interviewed everybody in the company and we developed a list of 38 points uh, that started from the minute that somebody called to the check cleared the bank. And then we analyzed every single step of the process for efficiency and changed some things and then we did that for every single department. And that allowed us to be able to outperform people that had been in the industry, some of them 15 to 17 years longer, and that had more money than we did. And in such a short period of time, we outperformed everybody in the entire industry. I also learned how important it is uh, that you have good partners. Good partners allow you the opportunity to be able to have a life. So I always talk about how important it is to be able to be, people talk about having balance. I talk about having harmony. And harmony between everything that I do in life. I I have had so many wonderful opportunities. And uh, when I was a young kid, like some of you guys, I liked to eat. I was tall, I was thin, I could eat whatever I wanted, and it was not uncommon for me to sit down and eat a whole pie. So I'm just saying that some people say that you cannot have the whole pie. And I'm here to tell you that you can have the whole pie, okay? Now you ask how, because there's a lot of people will say, no, you can't have a successful business and a wonderful family and be a bishop or a stake president in the church. And the answer is, no, you can. You really can. And I know a number of people that have. And in the scriptures, it actually gives the formula, and it's the division of the fishes and the loaves. It's a miracle. <laughs> But it happens, and I am a witness that it happens. I have an incredible family. I don't think that any of my kids would ever say that they went without their dad. I don't think that they have a mother that would ever say that she wasn't well taken care of emotionally, physically, financially, and in every other way. I don't, I don't think that uh, uh, my church calling ever suffered, ever. I've served in all those roles, and uh, I've never... Um, I've never, I never found that it was impossible to do everything. It's just that uh, you had to achieve harmony. And so it meant that whatever needed me most got me. If the church needed me most, it got me. If my wife needed me most, she got me. If my children needed me. For example, my son was the captain of his wrestling team in high school. I never missed one of his wrestling matches. I never missed one. So... I can tell you that you can have harmony and you can uh, accomplish a great many things. And if you decide to have partners, then pick your partners well. It's important to have good partners. I next decided that to take over uh, one of my portfolio companies, my partner had been asking me to run the company and I decided that when the downturn of the economy was there and and the private equity group wasn't listening, that uh, to take over as chairman, executive chairman of uh, health and benefit systems. And so we served in two years for that capacity. We prepared the company. We've been doubling now every two and a half years. Um, We're we're just killing it right now. Um, A lot of lessons, but a couple of interesting ones. Health and benefit systems has a truly unique delivery system. And so it allows us to be different than any of our competitors in the marketplace. It allows for a lot of low-hanging fruit. And we call this having a blue ocean strategy. 
Uh, perhaps you've heard it, but it's rather than swimming in red ocean with the sharks, who are all going after the same limited supply, be the only shark in the ocean and have all the supply to yourself. That's sort of the idea. Also, the difference between A and B players. I already knew this from Best Final, so when I came to take over, I said, Don, why do we have so-and-so as our controller? Because this person is not making a significant contribution and is such an important person. And he said, Scott, I mean, we've, I, don't want, I don't want to do this. And I, I'm, Don, you can't kill the mother to save the baby. Because if you make decisions that benefit only the baby, the mother, I mean, if the mother dies, the baby will die anyway. Because the baby is dependent upon the mother for survival. So you have to make decisions as hard as they are. So we brought in a new controller. And all of a sudden, about four or five months later, Don came to me and said, Scott, how in the world did we ever survive without Jake? Because that's the difference between having A players and non-A players in your company. And then I had a unique opportunity, while still here at Brigham Young University, of doing a turnaround on this BYU technology, Milleniata. It's permanent archival optical data storage. So this was a company that was dead. It had raised $15 million in shareholder uh, money. And they, the entrepreneurs were not entrepreneurs. They were business people, but they were not entrepreneurs. They did not know the correct way to start a business. They took that $15 million and they blew through it in two years, paying themselves enormous salaries to a company that had never turned a dime in revenue. They simply didn't understand. And, and so basically, they had done a lot of things that are not ethical and that were causing people throughout the valley, individuals that didn't really have the money to invest, but who were so excited about the potential of this technology that they got taken in to do it. And so uh, a friend of mine, we decided to, uh, to go and solve that problem, got elected to the board. We cleaned house, kicked out the old board, all the officers, started over, and, um, and, and we've got a great company going today. You can find it online. So um, one of the things that I learned in this particular uh, turnaround was how important it is, once again, to validate your products and your go-to-market uh, uh, strategy. So let me just give you a quick idea about this. So you only have so much money in a startup, and there's probably at least four or five and sometimes more ways that you can take a company to, to market. Now, in this particular company, they developed first the DVD technology. When you really did a study of the customers, what they were looking for was Blu-ray technology. Why were they looking for Blu-ray technology? Well, because you could put 25 gigs on a, on a disc instead of 4.7, and so it was a lot more storage capacity. Well, now, since then, we have the ability to go to 100 and 200 uh, on a single disk. But if they had known that at the beginning, they would have driven their technology uh, a lot different, and they had, their money, they had the money to do it. And in going to market, <coughs> excuse me, we could either um, go to the consumer market, or we could go to the uh, business market, the archival, and we developed a huge brand following uh, people thought we were huge and we were this tiny insignificant, but the way that we had done all of our uh, branding and marketing, we developed a whole following and, to, and turned out to be the right direction. So, um, and also one of the things that's important uh, is developing these KPIs and living by them. So we had a, an individual inside of the company uh, where, we, where our CEO at the time wasn't following, looking carefully at the KPIs. Anybody know what KPIs are? Okay, blurt it out. Key performance indicators. All right, in key performance indicators, you want to be able to test whether they're green, yellow, or red. If they're green, that means that uh, you're in a, tolerant, a margin of tolerance that's acceptable, that you've predetermined. If they're yellow, you're below that tolerance and you need to fix something. If they're red, you're way out of, you know. Well, we weren't, our CEO wasn't paying attention to that. We had one guy that, said he was achieving his objectives and he wasn't, and it really cost our shareholders another half a million dollars uh, that the company really didn't, couldn't afford. So it's really important to, that 
You know, it's a, businesses falter not because they don't have enough money, contrary to popular belief. They falter because there is insufficient know-how. That's why they falter. Well, currently, about a year ago, because it's hard for me to stay out of this, I co-founded and am actually the chairman and CEO. Uh, and where do I do it? I do it nights and weekends. So this is, uh, we developed the software that uh, is for the uh, field service vehicles industry, like the towing industry or the security industry, oil field services. There's a whole host of them that we intend to get into. But we cut our teeth on the towing industry and on the uh, um, uh, security industry, and we're killing it. And um, we've got a nice little company in the river woods, um, and we're just having some good success. So I started in 2010 at the Rollins Center here with the desire to give back and take all the different things that I'd learned, because I think I've made a lot more mistakes you know, than probably all of you combined. I talk about my. Um, thousand dollar mistakes and my ten thousand dollar mistakes and my hundred thousand dollar mistakes and then you get talking about your million dollar mistakes and unfortunately you could say that you want to stop at a million but frankly it goes higher sometimes you know and it just happens that uh, you know we're just people and you know you'd feel stupid actually if you sat back and thought about it long enough you just say what um, am I an idiot you know, do you, after all of this, I can't learn. I've gone through eight ventures, and I'm still making mistakes. Are you kidding me? Well, you know, I, I, when I lived back in Kansas City during the uh, height of the uh, internet bubble, what was interesting was uh, the CEO of Sprint. Um, he made a four billion dollar mistake, and I just have to tell you that, you know, you only know what you know, and it is what you don't know that will rise up and get you. And uh, so. But I've been here now for uh, uh, the last four and a half years, and the very first year that we were here, um, to show you how you can turn the ship of state quickly, and it doesn't take forever, I don't want to get too political, but contrary to what you know, politicians think and presidents think, you can turn the ship of state much faster if you know what you're doing. And in a period of one year, we became one of the top entrepreneurship programs in the country. And for five years running, we've been a top five program in the entire country. When we, um, um, shortly after I uh, started at the center, uh, Professor Nathan Fur and I co-founded the International Business Model Competition. It started with six universities, went to 30, went to 100, went to 200 this last year. Um, from 20 countries, and we had 2,500 teams participate. And at the end of that competition, as we had all these people from all over the world here at Brigham Young University in May, the Harvard team and the Stanford team said, you know, at Harvard, they shove the lean process down our throats, but they really don't show us how to use it. Coming here to the International Business Model Competition was worth the price of admission just to see people who understood lean and understood it well do it right. We really do have an amazing program here at Brigham Young University in our entrepreneurship program. It's because we have a vision to be the global leader in successful campus-inspired entrepreneurial ventures. And our structure allows us with curriculum, events, and competitions, and mentoring services, those four pillars uh, are what we build our program around. So you'll find that our curriculum is the most integrated curriculum across the planet in entrepreneurship. You'll find that the events that we offer are as good as you'll find anywhere, and probably better in most cases you'll find that our competitions probably don't have a big equal. And I'm not just saying that, you know, it's because I've obser observed it on many cases. And we happen to have a better mentoring program than anyone that I am aware of. And uh, it's, that's why the Harvard teams were able to say, is because we get in the middle of it. I mean, you have no idea how many mentoring hours that I put in, but when I'm done, you know, they really do understand how to present or how to take advantage uh, of what it is that they're trying to do. And then our rankings, of course, has been good, and it's all about you. That's why I'm here. I'm not here even for Brigham Young University, and I'm not here for the church. I'm here for you. I want to help the rising generation. If you look at the rising generation, go through the scriptures and just talk about Alma, or talk about what happened after Joshua, or talk about what happened so many different times in the scriptures, I am concerned and passionate about the rising generation and making sure 
that you have the tools that you need to succeed and prosper in the new economy. Um, so I want to uh, close in the next few minutes. How much time do I have? Are you kidding me? I got one minute left. Uh, we have been having way too much fun. All right. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I just want you to ponder that for a second. And I'm going to go over about one minute. And I hope I see all of you up in the uh, uh, Q&A up in 710. We'll have a chance to dig a little deeper. This is important. This is true. 3,000 years ago, there was little evidence to support it. And then about uh, four, 80 years ago, rather, Napoleon Hill penned these words, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And then in 2002, when I was doing research on my first book, this PhD scientist said, even the adult brain is plastic, able to forge new connections among its neurons and thus rewire itself. Sensory input can change the brain, and the brain remodels itself in response to behavioral demands. Now you think about that for a minute. The existence and importance of brain plasticity are no longer in doubt. The brain is dynamic, and the life we lead leaves its mark in the complex circuitry of the brain. Footprints of the experiences that we have had, the thoughts we have thought, the actions that we have taken. The brain allocates neural real estate depending on what we use most, the thumb of the video game addict, the index finger of a braille reader, the analytic ability of a chess player, the language skills of a linguist, but the brain rewires itself on something much more ephemeral than what we do. It rewires itself based on what we think. So, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Be careful about what you think, whether it be pornography or anything of the kind, or even negative thoughts that you allow to penetrate your mind and heart. You have the ability to control that. And it's the confidence that comes deep from within from affirmations about our relationship with heaven and ourselves and what it is that we expect to do while we're here that will create sufficient confidence for you to go out and do what I perceive that you will each do, and that is change the world. Grateful for the opportunity of being with, the, with you this semester. There isn't anything that I won't do as long as it's legal, moral, ethical, and not too fattening to help you. So make sure that you take advantage of these opportunities while you're in school because they're free. I'll see you in 710.